message this morning, uh, we're looking at Jesus the vine. So last time we looked at Jesus the comforter, and as we're learning about that, uh, the difficulties of life that we can always rely on God, uh, really talking about spiritual growth, and here again we're talking about bearing fruit, which is, goes again with spiritual growth. So this morning, we're going to talk about Jesus being the vine. That sounds like a very strange uh, way of describing Jesus. But you remember the seven I am statements in the book of John, like I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. When Jesus say he's the great I am, Jesus, the bread of life. This is the last I am statement in the book of John, where Jesus says, I am the vine. So this morning, uh, what we're going to look at, we're going, uh, as our theme for this morning will be fruit bearing, really like spiritual growth. Spiritual growth doesn't always feel good, but it's good for us. Uh, so as we will learn this morning as looking at fruit bearing, what it means to bear fruit, we're going to see uh, five images. We will see like five pictures that the Bible uh, shows us uh, this morning about fruit bearing. So First, we will see the vine, we will see the vine dresser, we will see the fruits, uh, we will see the branches, we'll see the fruits, and the friends. Again, so the five pictures we will see in this passage will be the vine, the vine dresser, the branches, the fruits, and the friends. Father, may you help us this morning as we study your word, as we look at uh, this imagery that you give us. May you help us, Father, to bear more fruit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to go through the text. We're going to look at verse 1 to 17 this morning. And we're going to go through the text. Just make sure that we understand the text. And then from there, we're going to take some lessons that uh, we can uh, learn uh, to grow uh, in Christ. So Jesus starts the passage by saying, I am the way, I am, uh, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. So here we see the vine, the image of the vine there is clear that who is the vine. So we see that Jesus is being the vine. I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, 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 like, uh, uh, in a vineyard, you see, like, the vine tree, it's, like, really long. It, it can take over. It goes crazy. So, so Jesus is saying that in our life, that Jesus says that he is the vine. And he says that the father is the vine dresser. That means the father is the farmer. The father is the one that takes care of the vineyard. Is the one that takes care of the vine. The father is the one who is in control. So the father, we would also say kind of like he's the gardener. So in Israel, uh, in the old days, uh, Israel often was referred to as a vine. Uh, uh, why uh, as a vine? Uh, because they were supposed to be bearing fruit. There was so much vine in Israel that that was even became their emblem at some point, where they would have the picture of the vine uh, were uh, almost everywhere uh, that you go. Uh, in Israel. So Jesus there called uh, Israel as the vine. They were supposed to bear fruit, but Israel did totally opposite of what God wanted them to do. So that's why uh, in Jeremiah uh, 2.21, it says, yet I planted you uh, a choice vine, holy and pure seed. How then have you turned uh, degenerated and become a wild vine. See, Israel was supposed to be the nation for God. They were supposed to be the people that live for God, but they were not. And God gave them everything that they needed to live for him. We see that also in Isaiah 5, where God called them a worthless, worthless grapes. So they were fruitless. In uh, Ezekiel, uh, God called them that they were a worthless uh, a vine. See, that's why Jesus now comes in. Jesus says, I am the true vine. 
I am the true vine. So Jesus says, hey, I chose Israel, but they messed up, but now I am here. Jesus says, I don't give you any substitute. I'm giving you me. I'm giving you the real deal. And now, as we get closer to the passage in verse 2, it says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That always scares a lot of people when you're reading this passage, when it says that uh, everyone in me that does not takes that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So we're often uh, worried. Uh, so can we lose our salvation? Because the Bible says the every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And here the branch is referring to Christians. But what we need to think about is not to go too much into the details is that uh, God is calling us here to bearing fruit. So Christians bearing fruit. When it's saying that uh, God, the one that does not bear fruit, God takes away. The word take away in the Greek is the word katharsis, which means to take away, to remove, but also means to lift up. Okay, so if you look at the vine, when the vine is growing, some of it might be like growing on the floor. There might be mud uh, on the vine and the vine is uh, not growing. So the farmer can also lift up that vine and clean it up so that that vine now can start producing fruit. Okay, when it says that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does not that does bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit so it says the ones who do not bear any fruit he takes away uh, uh often we're thinking that this is a some people think it's a reference to hell uh because as you burn it as you will see like in verse six but it can also mean also that god is lifting you up that God is lifting you up like he lift up uh, the vine, okay? So since we know with scripture, scripture clearly tells us that we cannot lose our salvation because John 6, 37 says, once you come to me, I will never cast you out. And in John chapter 10, uh, it says, my sheep knows my voice and they follow me and I will never turn them away. So here we know he's talking about Christians. It's more uh, in terms of uh, encouragement that those who are not bearing fruit, they need to be bearing fruit. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And then look at verse 3. It says, already you are clean so jesus is saying hey you are christians remember here he's talking to the 11 because at that point judas iscariot had left so really the analogy is kind of making there uh is that uh you can be a branch but you're not really connected just like judas iscariot was connected to jesus in every way but he was not really connected so that branch you could say kind of like cut away that's why some uh, bible scholars refer to this as being hell because jesus uh, judas you can say was cut away but those of us who believe that once you save you always save is saying that judas was really never in judas was just superficially there and talking to the 11 and when you come to verse 3 there makes it clearer where it says already you are clean because of the word that i have spoken to you so remember in chapter 13 when when jesus wanted to wash their feet then peter said no you will not wash my feet but jesus says uh if i do not wash your feet you have no part in me then peter said hey give me a bath 
But Jesus says, hey, you already clean. You just need a washing. So that's why here in verse 3 it says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So God is saying, hey, you are already clean. You are already a Christian as a branch. Now you need to bear fruit. See, that's why we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, and do the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, it says, since we are surrounded so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight. You see, a lot of things that we do as Christians, they may not be considered as sin, but they could be weight that we are carrying that hinders our growth. For example, if we're sitting all around uh, all day long and just flipping channels and just wasting time while we could be more productive, while we could spend our time to help somebody who is in need, while we could spend our time reading our Bible and growing and studying, while we could be doing something good, but instead we're just wasting time, there we are just being fruitless. And God wants us to move from being no fruit to some fruit, to more fruit, to much fruit, and then to remaining uh, in abiding and giving fruit, as we will see in the passage. So it says like the ones who are bearing fruit, he prunes. That's why in Hebrews, it says we need to lay aside every weight. Some things may not be sin, but God says that we need to lay them aside. Might be like, you know, some friends are not good for you in your life because they handle your spiritual growth. Jesus is saying we need to lay that aside. Lay that every weight and every sin, sin which sins, which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So as Christians, God wants us to bear fruit and we need to make it urgent we need to run so that we can bear fruit and in verse 4 it says abide in me and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you unless you abide in me so here we see Jesus as the vine, the father as the vine dresser, uh, the Christians as the branches. And Jesus is saying, hey, as a branch, you cannot bear fruit by yourself. The only way you can bear fruit is by being, uh, uh, cl by clinging to the vine, is being connected to the vine. And that's why it says there, uh, if you, you cannot bear fruit by yourself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. You see, bearing fruits involves uh, three characteristics. You see, it can re reflect our character. Our character, we need to see it in our character. It needs to be something that is visible. Not that we are just a closet Christian. And also, uh, uh, fruit is always for the benefit of others. Fruit is always for the benefit of others. So have you ever seen fruits on a tree? And if the tree keeps it for itself, what happens to that, to that fruit? It gets rotten. So that's why the Bible is telling us the fruit that God wants us to, uh, to produce, it's for the benefit of others. That's why we cannot be self-centered, that it's all about me, myself, and I. Because otherwise that fruit gets rotten. So that's why the Bible is saying, hey, uh, Jesus is the vine. We need to stay connected. The Father will help us grow, moving from no fruit to some fruit, to more fruit, to much fruit, and then to abiding in him. And then as the branch, that's us. We cannot bear fruit on our own. 
And then as the branch, we need to be bearing fruit. Otherwise, if we're not bearing fruit, there's no purpose for us. That's why it says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And then uh, 1 John 3, 20, it says, whoever keeps my commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given to us. The only way a Christian can bear fruit is by abiding in God. If you are not abiding in God, you are simply a fruitless Christian. And there's no such thing as fruitless Christian. So if you are a Christian, you're not bearing any fruit right now, you need to start bearing fruit. That's why the Father not just takes away, but lifts you up encouraging you and kind of like pushing you hey you need to get away from yourself now help somebody else and grow because you do not bear fruit for yourself you bear fruit for the benefit of others and then here in verse five it says i am the vine you are the branches whoever abides in me and i in him he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Jesus is saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, the way you bear fruit is not to do it in your own effort, but the way you bear fruit is by abiding in Christ, abiding in God. It says, if anyone in verse 6 does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. That's the verse that always scares a lot of Christians saying, oh, you see it here? We're, gonna, we're going to hell if we're not bearing fruit. And as a Christian, if you're not bearing fruit, you, you need to think about it. Okay, you need to do something about it, not think about it. You need to be bearing some fruit. People need to see in your life that Christ is visible, that Christ is in you. People need to see visibly that your character is changing. People need to see visibly that you are there to help others and, and meet the needs of others, but not be stuck up on yourself that it was just like me, myself, and I. Okay, when you focus on me, myself, and I, that's the way to get depressed. Remember, just like the fruit by itself gets rotten, but if you just focus on yourself, then that's just no good. Remember Dr. Kagumba's testimony as they went through some difficult time this year, COVID at the hospital, uh, on oxygen, you know, even felt like death was near. But you see, when you get away from yourself, and I know them, the Kagumbas, one of the great thing about them is that, you know, not focus on themselves, but see what God is doing. Remember, not wasting a trial, but using that and praying for others. You see, that's fruit. Because you're abiding now, you're bearing fruit, you're praying for others. That's showing up in your character that you are not selfish, but now you are looking at others. Yes, it's hard for me. But now I'm going to be praying for somebody else who is in need. You see there, it's talking about bearing fruit. And if this is a reference to hell to scare us to bear fruit, uh, so be it. Let's bear fruit. But from what we know from scripture, you know me, I give you full disclosure. It's not about fear for me. I don't want you to have a fear-based faith. But I want you to have a fear according to God's word, okay? God's word is clear. If you are a Christian, God says he will never cast you out. He will never cast you out. Here, this is a reference to help you. That's spiritual discipline. You know, sometimes you're not working with God. What God does, God brings some affliction into your life. Uh, when it says reference to being burned, that's more spiritual discipline than to be burning in hell. You know, sometimes you are literally being burned in life. 
Uh, when you're not walking with God, let's say you, you constantly telling lie, but if you're really a Christian, if you go at night, you cannot sleep well, you being burned. But if you say you're a Christian and then you just lie to someone, then you can go and sleep well, there's a problem there. Probably you just have a profession of faith, but you don't really have a possession of faith. So if you see that you go in life, you can sin and then not feel bad about it. You can sin and then just go on with life and like nothing happens, then you have a bigger problem. So probably you were like Judas. You were just around. You were just, you did everything with Jesus. You were in the branch, but you were a dead branch that you were never really connected. But that's why here it's saying, when it's talking about uh, uh, the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burn, that's a reference to spiritual uh, uh, divine discipline where God will make things happen in your life to start getting your attention. The primary way that God speaks to us is through his word. But a lot of us, we never open his word. Or if we hear his word, we don't put it into application. We don't do it. Because the Bible says, you see, uh, people who are not Christian, you know, a hell, you're looking at fire. But for Christians, it's a knife. Because the Bible says uh, your word, it's, it's like it's a double-edged sword. It cuts. So when God brings affliction into our life, it's like a knife. It's cutting. Whatever is not good, so that God can get our attention. God says, hey, you know, that friend was not good for you. I'm cutting them off. You see, God is saying that, hey, you've been lying too much now. You, I'm going to make sure you get cut. Uh, and then when you get cut, you still won't learn. God says, now uh, I think I'm going to get you to go to jail. You know, because you keep lying on your taxes, you keep doing this, you keep doing that, you're claiming things that you should not be claiming, you know, you get a warning, you know, you get cut, but you're still not learning now, you end up in jail, God is still trying to get your attention. But for some cases, it might be like an illness, God is trying to get your attention because you just did not go the easy way. By just reading God's word, abiding in his word, and doing his word once you do that because there's two ways you can learn things in life you can learn it from the experience of others <laughs> or you can have primary experience and it is a terrible thing when you try to have primary experience on everything you know you are experiencing every single thing here in verse six this is not a reference to uh hell remember this section here he's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to the 11 disciples here who were good branches, but some were not bearing fruit yet. God is encouraging them. Hey, you're not bearing fruit. Start bearing fruit. Get some fruits. As you get some fruit, God prunes you so you can get more fruit. As you get more fruit, God prunes you some more to get much fruit until you fully abide and remain in him. You see, we had some really dead uh, uh, trees at home, or plants, I should say. I know they look ugly, but I was scared to cut them off. Because I didn't want to, as I'm trying to prune them and actually kill them. Because I didn't know what I was doing. That's why you need the vine dresser. God the Father is the vine dresser. God knows where to cut. I didn't know where to cut, so what I did, I paid somebody to come and cut for me because they have experience and they've been doing it. And they went and cutting things, and they promised me by spring, they will start blooming again. See, probably if I went and cut them, probably they would die. See, that's why we need to rely on the Father to do the cutting. That's why we are not judges. God is the judge. That's why we have no business judging people. Okay, does it mean we should not encourage them? Yes, we should encourage people. If we see somebody doing a sin, yes, we should restore them. That's what 1 John tells us. But God is the judge and God is the discipliner. 
Is that a word? If that's a word, God is the one who disciplines us. So God will come and disciplines us where we need discipline so that we can bring us, he can bring us to him. I remember a pastor who was sharing, you know, there's a girl that he really loved, but she was playing hard to catch. And then one day, so what he did, he invited her to go to, a, uh, to an amusement park and then go on a roller coaster ride. And as they get to the roller coaster ride, as the ride, the ride was getting harder, the girl started clinging to him, you know? He says, that's, that, he created a situation so that he could get closer to that girl. And the girl starts squeezing his hand. See, that's the same thing that God will do for us. Because God loves us, remember, till the end, at the end of chapter 13. God loves us to the end. So God will not let us be fruitless. So God will bring some storms into our lives so he can draw us to him. Uh, remember, uh, Paul, Paul had an illness that really bothered him. Paul wanted God to heal it. Paul prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Nothing happened. But God's response to Paul was that my grace is sufficient for you. So really God said, hey, probably I need this to keep you humble. <laughs> but God says, my grace is sufficient for you. So let's continue in verse 7, it says, uh, uh, actually, uh, reference there uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, verse 11 to 15, that we know that this is not a reference to hell, but a reference to spiritual growth. And then God tells us, uh, as Christians, we will get rewards in heaven. And if we fail to bear fruit, when we get to heaven, we might be saved, but there will be no reward. Let's read it together. It says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. And look at verse 15. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be what? Will be safe, but only as flew fire it's like you could be a christian but you're a miserable christian where your life has been kind of like just you just going like for a roller coaster all your life where you're just being burned through fire and then when you get to heaven you never really have any lasting fruit or or you were just doing things because you were just showing up because what God is going to judge is our motivation for the things that we did when I helped that person was it for me to look good when I gave that money, was it that so that I could get more? Or was it I just gave it as a result of what God did for me? See, so God is saying that, hey, you might be saved, but you kind of saved through fire. It's like you're running to heaven, and then there's a little fire running from you. Okay, <laughs> I know that's one of the crazy passages that God teaches us. But God says, there will be reward in heaven. See, once we bear fruit, God says, even, uh, I think there's a passage that talks about, even in this life, when we do something good, we get a reward. Uh, how much more in heaven, we will get uh, a reward as well. And when we do bad things in this life, often we see the consequences. But, but it's the same concept there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. God says, you will be saved, but you will be saved through fire. So you don't want to be that kind of Christian that is just being saved through fire where you've done nothing productive in your life. But God is saying, be productive, bear fruit, bear fruit. And then in verse 7, it says, all uh, in verse uh, John 6, 37, I referred to earlier, it says, all that the Father gives me uh, will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will do what? Never cast out 
That's what, as a believer, we can rest on God's uh, eternal security for our life. But should we get comfortable and not bearing fruit? No. We should be bearing fruit. We should always look for opportunities to bear fruit. And look at verse 7 to 10. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You see benefits again, even in this life. God says, hey, when you abide in me, guess what? You will be blessed. Just like when you bear fruits, there will be reward in heaven. Ask whatever you wish will be done for you. And I think a lot of people struggle with this verse. Oh, I asked God for this. I asked God for that. And God never answered. But are you abiding? And then remember Paul, the great Christian who would most of the New Testament. He prayed for God to heal him. God never did. God knows what we need. So once we abide in God, we, be, we know his will and, and his will become ours. That's why when we ask anything, it will be done because we are abiding in him. By this, the, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandment and abide in his love. A lot of us, we want to answer prayer, but we don't want to follow God's word. You got to keep his commandments. That's how he answers your prayers. John 14, 23, Jesus says, and, uh, Jesus says, if anyone loves me and keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. Just say, you abide in me, I will abide in you. And it will be that perfect marriage. And in verse 11, it says, this things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that what? Your joy may be full. Can you use some joy today? Yeah. Yeah. All of us can use some more joy in our life. And that's where Jesus says, hey, when you abide in me, that's the result there. You will have my joy and you will have my joy to the full. See, I love the way uh, Tony Evans uh, described joy with a little twist to it from me. Uh, it says, joy is an inter internal stability despite external circumstances because we know God is in control of every situation, even the ones we hate. So whatever is happening in your life that is external, whatever circumstances that you face, internally you are stable. It's an etern internal stability despite whatever you face. In verse uh, 12, it says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love as no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So now we saw the vine, which is Jesus, the vine dresser, the father, the branches, us Christians, this will put our faith and trust in God. We saw fruits as Christians, we need to bear fruit. And then lastly, we saw the friends. See, God calls you, God calls me a friend and not a slave. See, what do friends do? Friends share information with each other, right? Friends help each other. Friends know what friends are doing. And here Jesus says, uh, greater love has no one than did that someone lay down his life for his friend. And what did Jesus do for us? He laid down his life for us. It says, you are what, my slaves? It says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. So Jesus says, if you abide in me, you walk with me. Guess what? We are friends. How many of you could use a friend? You see, the, the, a lot of us, often we talk about poor people. A lot of the, when we talk about poor people, we're talking about materially, being materially poor. 
But you know, a lot of us are relationship poor. And it's even worse than being materially poor, not having a friend. A lot of people may have all the treasures in this life, but not having a friend to share it, you don't really enjoy it. I remember a friend who went to a party and then a bunch of people there and then people come to him. They thought that he was the other guy. That was not even his party. But they thought that was him. People were just coming to the party. They didn't even know whose party it was. That's what it's called, like, you know, trying to buy friends. See, a lot of people, you may have a lot of possessions, but not have any friends. You are as poor or if not even worse off than somebody who is materially poor because you are relationship poor. And you have a lot of people that are just relationship poor. And Jesus do not want us to be relationship poor. Jesus wants to be our friend. It says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. That's why you see a lot of people in, on Facebook might have a lot of connections. But they really have no friends. If they have a problem, they cannot contact any of those contacts they have on Facebook. And they call them friends. Well, they may have a thousand friends or followers, but really there's no relationship. They are relationship poor. And a lot of time when you see people, they always have to post something on Facebook. It's because they are desperate for attention. Because they have nobody to share it with. Because once you are relationship poor, that's the greatest poverty that you can have. It is worse than being materially poor. Better to be materially poor than to be relationship poor. And Jesus do not want us to be relationship poor. Jesus says, not only I will provide for your needs, but I also want to be your friend. I want to be your friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. You see how many times he used the word friends? Because a lot of us are relationship poor and we need a friend. And Jesus says, you have a friend in me for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So Jesus is saying, it's not like a superficial friendship, but it's Jesus is saying, this is real stuff. Because I want to show you everything that God tells me. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear what? fruits and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name he may give it to you so jesus says i want you to bear fruit and jesus is saying i want to give you stuff jesus says i want to be your friend all that you have to do is just abiding in me these things I commend you so that you will love one another. There you go. That's the fruit there. How you bear fruit is by loving one another, serve one another. So what's the message today as we look at this passage here in John 15, verse 1 to 7? And simply this, Jesus is asking us to do three things. The first one, Jesus wants us to abide in Christ. He wants us to abide in Christ. Abiding in Christ is that God lives in you and you live in him. That you are totally and unholy dedicated to him. That your life is not about you, that it's all about God. You give it all to God. You let God live in you. God says abide. That means live in me. Have a union with me and communion with me. Jesus is saying, what we need to do today is to abide in him. Live in him. It's that perfect union. Communion with him daily by meditating on his word. Not only you read his word, you meditate on it. That means you think about it and then you do it. That's why it says there to obey. Jesus wants you not only abide in Christ, he wants you to obey. That means you do it. Jesus says, 
If you love me, you will keep my commands. If you really love Jesus, you keep his commandment and you obey. And Jesus wants you to obey. It's not really for him. It's more for you. Because God wants to provide for you. He wants to be your friend because he knows what you need. And it says we need to bear fruit. Because Jesus says when we are stuck up on ourselves, we just get rotten. Just like the fruit on the tree just stays in the tree and nobody eats it. The fruit gets rotten. The fruit is for the enjoyment of others. So our life is for the enjoyment of others. That we are serving the needs of others, not focused on ourselves. So Jesus wants us to do those three things. Abide in him, obey him, and bear fruit. And once we do that, that's the result. The result in verse 11 is joy. Remember, Jesus wants to give us joy and give it how? Just some joy? He wants to give us joy to the fool. And then he wants us to enjoy God's love. Enjoy the Father's love in verse 12. And then in, in verse 13 to 15, he wants us to enjoy God's friendship and fellowship. Friendship, fellowship means like you are communing together and the result will be experiencing answered prayer. So as a Christian, the more you're working with God, the more you should see your prayers getting answered. If as a Christian, you see that your life is still going and your prayers are not being answered, something is off. You need to abide more in Christ. The more you abide in Christ, the more God will answer your prayer. And if you want to learn more about this, go back and listen to chapter 14 when I talk more extensively about answered prayer. And then lastly, the result is increasing our ability to love. Don't you find it hard to love sometimes? Yeah, yeah it just comes easy. Grow up, you'll see. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's just, it's just hard to love. It's just hard to love sometimes, especially when you have been hurt, when somebody has wronged you, it's just hard to love. But Jesus says, hey, as a result of abiding in me, obeying me, and bearing fruit, guess what? You will increase your ability to love. See, that's why our church, that's our mission. Our mission is to love God, to love people to serve our city, our community, and to reach our world for Christ. And you see, it goes directly with this passage here. Love God is what? You are abiding in God. Because that's where it starts. That's the start. You abide in God. Love people, love others. Guess what? You are obeying him because that's how you will know Christians. You will know them in chapter 13, remember, by their love. John 13, 34 and 35, it says, you will know them by their love. It's your love that shows that you truly believe in God. And then remember, once you abide in God, you are obeying God. The purpose is for you to be bearing fruit. And as a church, we bear fruit by serving our city. Find things in our city that we can do that will help. And not just our city, but beyond reaching our world for Christ. When we see a need somewhere else that we can meet, we meet that need. See, love God, love people serve our community because once you love God, you love people, that means you've found your purpose, you found freedom because you're no longer stuck up on yourself once you get the first two. But because of that now, once you're not stuck up on yourself anymore, you found that freedom, you find purpose, now you can serve and bear fruit. You serve and you reach your world for Christ. So, that's our mission. If you didn't know when you joined our church, that's what you need to be doing. You need to be abiding in God. You love God. You need to be loving people, even people who are unlovable in your eyes. You need to be loving people. Not only that, you need to be serving. 
you it's not about you it's about others remember the fruit is not good for itself it's good for others serving and reaching our world for christ serving there and i love the way that another writer puts it you know how can you bear fruit and much fruit more specifically he shows seven c's seven ways you can actually bear fruit first you can bear fruit in your character Remember Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the spirits. You can bear fruit in your character. Bear fruit in your character. The second C is bearing fruit in your conduct. Bearing fruit in your conduct. People need to see it in your action. You cannot say that you're a Christian and then your actions do not speak it. Your actions do not show it. You do it in your character Remember the, the uh, first Corinthians, uh, Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the spirits, they are joy, love, gentleness, patient, Woo! remember this one, patient, kindness, gentleness, these are the fruits of the spirit, so our character, our conduct, uh, that's what we see in Romans 6, 22, when it says that, you know, our conduct needs to display conduct of Christians, then contentment, don't we all need some contentment? Isn't it funny after thanksgiving, when we say that we are all thankful and then what comes next? Black Friday, I need more, right? But on thanksgiving, we're saying how grateful that we were. See, the other C is for contentment. We need to be content. And then uh, in our conversation, does our conversation help others? See, the Bible says that let our uh, uh, speech be uh, seasoned with salt. So really, when we're talking to people, is it words of encouragement? Or are we just tearing people down? See, in our conversations, then a concrete service for God, where we help others. We see somebody in needs, we meet their needs. Concrete work uh, of service for God and converts. When we share the gospel with somebody and somebody receive God's word and become a Christian, we are bearing fruit. And lastly, is to grow children for God. That's discipleship. Having spiritual children. You see, Paul always talk about, you know, spiritual children that he had. And as Christians, that's what God calls us to do. 